So anyhow, what, I'll, what I think to do is to simply read your particular questions from these two letters and then give you like a, a, an answer such as, such as it can be. Uh, I, here, for example, quote, I suppose what I'd like to know is more about your acquaintance with Edward. When exactly did you meet him? I think I may be wrong as to the exact year, but I can remember that it, I want to say it was in the spring and it coincides with Edward's having come from California to London and then despairing of London and going to Paris where he had met uh, Alex Trochi and Austin Wainhouse and others, I suppose Christopher Logue, other people involved with the, with the um, Merlin group and had spent a little time there and then on their suggestion, I think Alex's suggestion, he'd come on to Mallorca and Alex had given him my address so that on his arrival, he appeared at our house in Bonanova, above uh, El Terreno, above Palma, and um, we happily were able to offer him, uh, uh, you know, a place to stay for what proved to be a very short period. Simply that he and, he and my wife, which is the story in itself, didn't didn't get on at all. <coughs> but at that point, for example, I had known of Edward's work uh, primarily through Olson. Uh, my first acquaintance with him as a writer was Charles's sending me in the late 40s, when I was still living in New Hampshire, uh, a copy of Bottom Dogs, which had just been published in, uh, in the Direction series by James Lachlan. And I think the, uh, I mean, Edward understandably wanted active reviews of the book, and I think he probably applied to Charles to do one. But at that point, their relationship was really uh, strained, if at all uh, actual. And... Charles really couldn't do it. He 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 resisted it on the grounds of the uh, of the kind of post-Marxist thinking of the book. The the terminology, I think, the proletariat versus whatever else. I think that um, I think that dismayed him and didn't really seem to be something he specifically could talk of with much use. And he didn't really want to lay a bomb on Dalbert. And he therefore asked me if I w if I would consider, it, although I was markedly unknown and, and certainly a much younger writer. So. Possibly picking up on Charles's discomfort with the book, but probably just that I literally couldn't couldn't. It was a very active and different kind of vocabulary than I w than I was used to. I mean, I was reading people like Williams on the one hand, or let's say Wallace Stevens, and suddenly with this wildly compounded, uh, s almost symbolic language, really, but very personal to the writer, although taken from obviously very common sources. Uh, it was a kind of writing that I felt very at e uh, ill at ease with. So um, my response to the book, uh, this is not Bottom Dogs, this is Flea of Sodom, the book I'm trying to, trying to locate. I didn't read Bottom Dogs until some years later. In any case, uh, my first take on the Flea of Sodom was, uh, like, I don't understand what this man's talking about. I truly didn't. I had no sophistication in political matters, nor in thinking of the order he was involved with, nor was I at all, invo you know, knowledgeable about urban, urban, let's say, realities. So in any case, I, I just didn't respond. But I knew of Edward, therefore, and I later, uh, seems to me possibly, I don't know, let's see, it seems to me possibly after I'd been, I can't remember if it was after I went to Black Mountain or before I'd gone to Black Mountain for the first time that I met Edward. Um, but in any case, I remember the Immoral Proposition had been published. So it would be like 54, 55, right around in there. In any case, uh, I knew Edward, but I don't think Edward knew me. I know he didn't know me at all, except as some younger friend, or young friend, let's say, of a uh, contemporary of Alex's, uh, who might offer him some place to stay and help him locate himself on Mallorca. Arlene was still in... Um, California finishing up her stint as a, as a librarian, and she was then to come over to join him. Uh, what, so that's when exactly did you meet him. We could, you could really check the dates by finding, or just checking with when, uh, when does Edward go to, to, yeah, when does Edward first go to Mallorca? Because that's when he first, when I first met him. And I met him that, I would say, almost the first day he was there. Um, did he welcome you with his usual enthusiasm for promising young writers? At that point, he didn't know, I don't think clearly that I was a writer. He probably assumed that I was, because I was a friend of Alex's and so on, that I was the trying to write. And I was in an extremely blocked uh, in, 
really, really uh, stultified state of mind. I wasn't restless or bored. I was just like literally almost hysterical with uh, a feeling of impotence. And I was living, you see, primarily with a cluster of um, various English or and or European writers. I had really had no res no no relation at that point uh, actively to uh, except through mails with anyone who was literally an American writer. I was in company either with uh, Martin Seymour Smith or uh, with Robert Graves. It must have been '55 because Martin by that time had left the island, and um, so Edward came and we and I. I really was impressed with him on the instant. He, he's, a, he's obviously, as you well know, he's a, he's a cranky, singular, and loner kind of man. Uh, but as we talked about senses of writing and whatnot, he, be he became extremely attractive to my head. And he, <coughs> he looked at some of my writing, I think primarily poems. He looked through a few, you know, a few lines and said, that seems good, and you know, very clear statement, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was impressed that I seemed to have an, an almost compulsive need to say very little. He one time, for example, said of For Love, um, you know, B Bob, why do you try so hard to say so little? <laughs> Which I really, I mean, it's a good question. I wonder, too, why I try so hard to say so little. But Anne, my wife then, uh, really took exception to him. She was she was really felt a very... Uh, a decisive relation to my writing. I don't know that she valued it specifically, but she felt that she'd obviously done a lot to help it get written. I mean, she'd supported it literally, uh, insofar as we were living on her income. Uh, she'd been patient with my own fl fumbling about, and she'd put money into the Divers Press, which was our, you know, p scene in, in, in Mallorca. So um, when Edward sort of made this, you're not cryptic, but this very, uh, he looked quickly at these poems, uh, uh, then made a very very clear statement of his of his opinion, and she she was uh, she was offended that he seemed to do it so casually, and he said, "Young woman, I've been reading you know I've been reading and writing for for a long time, and it doesn't take me uh, I don't have to read all the work to have a sense of what the competence of the writer is uh, as it's literally present in in, in in any line of it, and I believe I mean I knew what he was talking about, but sadly I don't think Anne did, so that. Um, the evening wore on. I think this was even the first night he was in the house. The evening wore on into an absolute horrible uh, hysterical argument between my wife and Edward, uh, which finally led to her accusing him of being homosexual, which was certainly hysterical. And uh, hers, his shouting at her, uh, young woman, uh, when your bones are moldering dust, mine will be carried through the streets by the cheering multitudes, which I thought was one of the, the great statements of all time. And I, in the meantime, this kind of impotent, uh, you know, like sad figure of young American manhood uh, was fluttering between both persons. I was truly really wanted, I really wanted Edward's company. I mean, I really wanted his true help. I wanted to talk to someone who had the intimate condition of being, as he obviously was, a very, a very particular kind of American writer that I, that I felt myself hopefully to be also, I mean, a loner, without the privilege or the habit of a, a social group having to make up or discover a language particular all by oneself so that his uh, his his significance to me in that way was was instantly immense uh and he really we had a sympathetic rapport i think from the first um i was shy and quiet and responsive and really would delighted in listening to him and i think he sensed that i really needed help as he, as he says uh, a lonely young man with no symptoms of worldliness um so uh, that first night, they had this awful argument. Ended up with me and Anne having a continuing argument, in which I struck her, which I've always regretted. It was I was hysterical as anyone. Edward going to bed and then coming down the next day and saying uh, to Anne, "Why couldn't she find it in her heart to forgive him? I mean, or rather, why couldn't she find it in her heart to accept his forgiveness of her?" That was, I think, the way it was pointed, which really bugged her. I mean, she was a a typical New England uh, Wellesley girl. And that seemed to her just uh, just uh, unacceptable, so she split. And Edward and I sort of uh, continued around the house for a while, and then I volunteered to help him find a place, a pension in the city, in Palma, which he then went to. We, we got him a place. And also, I think, either that day or very shortly after, introduced him to Graves on the ho in the hope that Graves might help, help him find a, a, a good place. So that from that point on, and for bad, 
Edward access to the house. I don't think he was particularly interested to come anyhow. But I would see Edward not surreptitiously, but the but the rule was, let's say, that I would only see Edward in my own, you know, in my in my own uh, in my own place and time. And I saw him a lot. Uh, so he began asking me in the classic, almost pound tradition, what did I what had I read? And he um, he introduced. I read one book. I read very specifically on his instruction was Burnett's. Uh, a uh, book on the on the on the um, pre-Socratic philosophers. In fact, I was so impressed by that book that I made the assumption that uh, Charles uh, Olson had also taken off in, on on Edward's interest in it. Uh, it turned out later he hadn't that he'd used another way of getting to the same material. But uh, that book was really s seminal for me. And then he ran out on his Life of Christ. I think he want he wanted me to read. Uh, he gave me a book list, which I, to my horror, had lost by the subsequent day and never dared tell him, uh, which is probably the story of my life. Uh, anyhow, how do you evaluate his importance to literature? One very kind of striking uh, instance of what I'd call loosely the kind of American writer that Edward, you know, decisively is, uh, would be to put him in contrast with Robert Graves, uh, at first, the two men got on very well. They both had the same, um, they had, let's say, they had the same take on 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 the f on let the function of Judas in in the whole uh, in the whole structure of the, or whatever, in the whole occasion of the crucifixion. They felt that Judas contributed the most, you know, the instance of the the most human vulnerability and presence, insofar as he was guilty of that betrayal, that he undertook the responsibility, so to speak, for that for that human human dilemma. Uh, and became a, a curious, paradoxical saint of that of that circumstance. Edward uh, remembers talking to Slater Brown, in, I think, in some park in New York, and having the same res finding that they concurred in that sense. I think it was possibly Slater who suggested it. But in any case, this very much interested them that they had both worked in a particular way, apropos the the context of Jesus, etc. And that they both come to some rather, you know, significant agreement in that real, in that sense of Judas. So things really went well for for a few days. And Dalberg was, I think, a frequent visitor at Graves' place, and Graves was really sort of intrigued and attracted by this cranky American. Uh, but then, not too long after that, egos began to clash. Uh, there was the morning that Edward arrived early, apparently for, you know, just to see what the apartment scene was and found the Graves is just about to have breakfast, to which they invited him, but he had eaten. So Graves said, um, well, uh, uh, perhaps this would interest you, and gave uh, Edward a copy of Punch, in which Graves had an article. And uh, Edward just sort of slapped it on the table and walked out in, in a high, in a high irrit dudgeon or irritation. So he said, you know, it's bad enough to publish in such a magazine, but to expect another man to read it is absolutely inseparable. And at that point, they were off and running as far as their, their irritation. Um, and one p also, Graves would say things like, uh, do you mean to say you don't read Greek? In other words, what I'm trying to locate here is the fact that American writers, as a, uh, of the order that, that, that um, Edward is, are what Ginsburg, or Allen Ginsburg would call, they're in the great tradition of, uh, of American eccentric. I mean, I was thinking of Whitman or Poe, for example, or Pound himself, I mean, an, an incredible and laboriously, or Melville, a laboriously uh, accumulated information of language, which becomes, on the one hand, extraordinarily personal to them, as witnessed Edwards, or and equally is the most meticulous gleaning of previous uh, previous writings, as again Edward is instance, or uh, parallel to Melville, uh, or Poe for that matter, or Whitman for that matter. I mean. Whereas the European, as Graves, tends to inherit a mode of language which he makes personal to himself if he even thinks to do so, or he or she even thinks to do so. But they write in a style which is the long information of a social pattern as well and, and, and a habit of life in a particular place and time. Whereas the American has far more the dilemma of, say, spatial orientation, wherein language becomes almost an invention. Uh, Edward, for example, told me that as a, any remarks in his writing as a young man, he would write on the, you know, on the trolleys in, in San Francisco uh, uh, saying words over and over aloud just to get the physical feel of them, words that he would be embarrassed to test out in silence just that he would become self-conscious. I mean, really an incredibly self-designed self, self -designed, um, 
language or language designed entirely within the responsibility of the of the writer. Rexroth has some of this characteristic again. It's rare indeed that you find a, a European writer quite of that circumstance. I suppose David Jones would be one possible instance, but it's but it's very or Blake, but it's not a particularly um, usual pattern. Whereas in this country, it is. I think Edward is epitome of of, uh, of that of that situation of being an American writer. So his importance to literature is not only that he continues that tradition, but that he is such a such a singular instance of its resources. I mean, his language is, on the one hand, utterly personal to him, but it's but it echoes and and, and continues an incredible range of what I want to call a, a truly a, a truly. He hates the common, or at least he, the vernacular for him is like uh, anathema. He, one of his qualifications of Olson was that um, Olson was playing to the people by using a a, a kind of street vernacular. Uh, Edwards ha Edwards has a beautifully common tested ring in his language, despite despite. Uh, you know the um, the r the rhetoric that is equally its pattern. And his book for the books the book that I find absolutely without without um, absolutely singular is because I was flesh. I think it's one of the great books of the, of that reality ever written. And uh, its value thus is I mean it's, how can you calculate it? It's his writings his writings in other senses, e.g. Uh, him to Priapus or Flea of Sodom or um, you know can these bones live uh, I just I find him of critic in that so in terms of his critical ad attitudes and writings I find him uh, in the same company with Lawrence and with um, with Olson's uh, call me Ishmael I mean in that order of, uh, of, of how how you respond to it to, to, to the experience of reading he, I mean again he's, he's absolutely extraordinary so I don't want to evaluate his importance to literature in some categorical or scheduled manner. I simply find him, uh, he's the instance of the utterly singular American writer, w which seems paradoxically to be a tradition in our literature. And he's a seminal figure. He seems to stay, <coughs> he seems to stay ins insistent and to survive an incredible, um, you know, true amount of difficulty. He hasn't written a huge bulk of. He's not. He's not a. He does. He doesn't. He hasn't. He's not a prolific writer, truly. But he's stated himself as a writer all his life, and he's maintained it as a as a, as a form of existence. And he's 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 he both hewed to a sense of language and determined its, his own uh, use of it with extraordinary uh, clarity. Yeah, honestly, that is, Allen Ginsberg told me he considers Edward a seminal figure, a father figure, if not a father to the beats, for example. Do you concur or have a different opinion? Uh, he was basically unknown to my generation until the uh, late 50s, as far as I could judge. Possibly Allen knew of him previously. Um, I know that the that Trochi and that group really were delighted by him. They had a hard time with him. He There's a lovely st story told by Austin Waynehouse that you really should hear from him directly. Um about the farewell dinner given Edward in, in, in uh, where he really complained of the food <laughs> most of the meal. And these young men had, you know, had really very slender resources and they'd managed to get together enough to take him to a restaurant they thought was terrific. And Edward was discontent with the provision, et cetera, et cetera. And he had stored, um, s you know, wardrobe trunks and stuff, or books mainly in, in, in the basement of the building in which Austin Waynehouse lived under a little, like, workman's bar. So Austrian said they, he decided he had to leave pr the city instantly, and uh, Austrian and his wife, who lived on the top floor, were about to go out to a rare dinner, and uh, Austrian had dressed for it, and now he was being asked by Edward to come downstairs and speak to the man at the bar and get the key and unlock the cellar and get the trunks out and stuff, which he did, I mean, characteristically of Austrian. And uh, Edward's irritation was mounting all the time, so that by the time they got into the bar to get the key, Edward was really leaning on Austrian uh, in a way that was sort of calling attention to himself and this was a workman's bar and Austrian was fearful that something might blow up there but they happily got through that then they got down in the cellar whereupon Austrian was expected to haul the books uh, the boxes of stuff up the stairs he said during which time Edward was sort of shouting down things like uh, you're all a bunch of dirty little homosexuals etc etc and that disappointed them obviously uh, but what I'm trying to say is that you re one really put up with an awful lot from Edward in social sense is just that his, 
the uniqueness of his condition was extremely interesting to any young writer of that time, as far as I was aware. And Bottom Dogs, for example, when one got to it finally, was obviously an absolutely, absolutely singular book of American experience and consciousness. Um, his effect on Olson, of course, is unmistakable and well-documented, although Olson, like everyone else, is on D's shit list. Um, has he fertilized your writing at all in ways that may or may not be obvious to someone reading both of you? Um, he... I don't think I've... I think I've taken a, a sense of what a writer is from Edward. I mean, he he was possibly the heaviest, let's say, in the, in, in, in the vernacular, <laughs> probably the most uh, real American writer I, I, I had met at that point. I don't know that I've ever met a, one that was more real to me in, in imagination or in fact. Um, he, he made me face up to something, uh, not only the difficulties of my marriage, which were obviously apparent to anyone outside of it, but he... He really made me take myself seriously, uh, which I was really loath to do. I didn't, it wasn't that I was like a playboy of the scene or something, but I was really so fucking shy and modest that I w it was really an excuse for not, for not putting myself forward in some more active manner, for delaying kinds of commitment and assertion of those commitments uh, that was really going to be increasingly uh, difficult. So, frankly, in in focusing for me upon the difficulties of my relation with Anne. It wasn't just that he was gossiping about her or something like that. They were just saying, well, look, uh, you're really driving yourself into the ground. Uh, he one time said, Bob, someone's gonna, some friend of yours as myself is going to find you in uh, 20 years, let's say, and you'll be sitting on the curb and your face will be all bloody and your clothes will be filthy and you'll just be a derelict and you'll, they'll ask you with obvious commiseration and interest, uh, Bob, what happened? And you'll begin by saying, uh, I was born May 21st, 1926. I mean, you can't, you can't rationalize all of the events of your life. You've got to move on impulse and commitment uh, more decisively. So, he, f yeah, he fertilized my writing in that respect unequivocally by making me take a severe and real look at what I was doing. And I respected his opinion very much. Uh, he also, uh, he rearranged, uh, not that he dictated, but that he made me reconsider kinds of almost sentimental interest I had in various pieces of writing. I mean, he, um, I remember he, I, I was an absolute, and am an absolute uh, devoted, absolutely devoted, let's say, to Williams. Hopefully not just in some bullshit or sentimental manner, but I really have learned so much from him. <laughs> But Edward would give me a perspective, let's say. He said, you know, Williams is very bitter. And uh, as a younger man, that had never occurred to me. Although then when I reconsidered, it was ob completely obvious that he was a, a deeply bitter man in very particular ways, apropos his acceptance by the literary establishment, et cetera, et cetera. The kinds of confinement he felt in his life, the literally restless quality of his life, the, uh, the not the duplicity that he practiced, but the almost schizophrenic patterning of his relationships. Um, and the letter, for example, that he includes in Patterson is instance that he was certainly aware of Edward's, um, Edward's perspective. I wish I, you know, I wish I could ask you more pointed questions. Uh, I'm especially, of course, to gather anecdotes of Dahlberg. Um, well, there are many. Uh, he had an almost... I remember Charles, for example, and I don't want to quote inappropriately, so, but Charles had a sense that Ed was really possessed by the demonic at times. I mean, that he was really um, almost cursed with, it, with, it, with this, this curious need to, not to distort, but to usurp kinds of, kinds of human occasion. Um, I remember a woman of my acquaintance uh, in Mallorca who was a mutual, had a, Edward and she had a mutual friend, uh, so that he was, after he he, sp he went out to Solier, where she was then living, and spent time with her, like a day or two. And she said she found herself inexplicably in bed with him. Uh, and I'm only telling you this, so to speak, just to say he had, a, he had an almost uh, a very curious ability to I want to say truly to coerce other people at times in their, in their decision in ways that they were literally apparently unaware of. I'd really trust this woman's report. It's not some kind of, uh, uh, you know, silly, silly uh, explanation as to how she happened to, to go to bed with him. She said she literally didn't know how she got there. And again, uh, the next morning when she came down in some confusion, uh, 
and he'd gone off to his own bedroom subsequently uh, he, he, he said to her, why are you so cold? <laughs> I mean, Edward was constantly qualifying people as being warm or cold. Uh, Graves, for example, he finally dismissed as being cold, as not having any warm, real warm condition of blood or person. He felt the same way, sadly, about Alistair Reed. I mean, people who tended to turn off from Edward socially were almost always accused of being uh, cold and uh, having, you know, having um, cold water for blood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he really demanded an entire intention. He, he uh, remember at one point when he was leaving Mallorca, uh, we had met in the street at for, and he was thinking to go see Richard Aldington, and we were now standing in the street I never asked him if I had the right address or not, but in any case, he asked me if I knew Arlington's address, and I'd been in correspondence with Arlington in, while living in France, primarily, and um, had always meant to go see him and never unhappily got there. But I did remember the address, I thought, so I said, well, Edward, it's such and such, you know. He said, now, Bob, I hope you're right, you know. And I really thought, well, Edward, what you're really asking me is, do I remember Arlington's address? And I'm telling you as best I can what I do remember, and I don't want to be held in some weird, uh, you know, responsibility for what obviously I'm, I'm, I'm factually unsure about. But I mean, he he really made me, um, he really made me, as he made obviously others feel that uh, what they gave him as response was crucial, not only to him but to themselves. And uh, I felt a very long. I remember, for example, uh, being with him when we were we were going to go out and eat something or something, I'd come over to the pens pension, and uh, he was shaving. And that I do remember kind of sadly, uh, just that he went over and over again. In other words, he would shave an area on his cheek, and then he would return to it and reshave it. He, he had a lot of uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, like aftershave lotion, stuff like that. It was, he was really... Uh, concerned with the surface, let's say, of his body as it was in some way paradoxically offensive to him. He, I remember also one time when we'd been walking in the street and it was quite hot, we'd gone into a little restaurant just to get something cool to drink and uh, Ed, Edward didn't want a beer or whatever, so he uh, chose some kind of soda pop and I ordered, I guess, for him because he didn't, didn't know quite what would be appropriate. And he uh, took one slug of it and said, Ah, sweet! <laughs> <laughs> spewed it out all over the counter. I mean, anything that was like, let's say, I don't want to say sensually easy, but anything that was sweet or comfortable in that particular way or convenient, really, Edward, I think, really uh, tended to question entirely. Let's see. I want to continue here to see if there are any more. You've got some more specific questions here. Um, it was Edward, by the way, who first, uh, first thought that... Um, that I that I should um, I should both be in touch with Louis Zukowski and, and should, if possible, publish him. Um, I, sh I sure uh, I sure thank him for that for that. Um. Then on the next letter you have here, do you know anything about his mix-ups with Graves? Um, yeah, it was an ego trip. I mean, it was Edwards, as far as I remember, and I and I was uh, I'd introduced them both, and I was in some ways, you know, familiar with with them at that point. And um, uh, let me just break for a minute. Yeah, to 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 go into that possibly more accurately, the at the outset you see, Graves had just finished. I think he just finished writing the Nazarene Gospel Restored, and so Edward's interest in 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 that in that material was a happy coincidence, and I think that really eased the the meeting and the fact that both were. We're professional writers and both understandably believing in some actual integrity of their own occasion, simply that they weren't working for high powered magazines or doing straight journalism. I mean, they really, both of them claimed and I think had right to, uh, you know, an active uh, integrity of, of, of um, in their writing. But the social patterns of both men were very, very uh, different. Uh, they, uh, Edward, I mean, Graves' white goddess uh, emphasis, I think, would finally be um, boring to Edward, truly. Edward's far more Old Testament, and uh, <laughs> I don't think he bought that trip very much. Uh, but what really they fell out about was uh, the fact that, I mean, Graves was really claiming that 
he supported the integrity of his poetry by you know by doing a lot of prose that brought in an income that su that, that permitted him to write the poetry I mean that was his his basic logic Edward uh, Edward felt that that was a cop out I mean that he was writing a lot of um, junk and you know publishing in magazines that shouldn't be supported by his interest or certainly not by simply being there to for hire and um, like it or not he really uh, qualified Graves in that way he felt he was just a a hustler, a brilliant hustler, without question. I mean, I don't think he'd, he'd uh, but that a man who never f really found a, 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 a true use of himself. And Edward, in, in those attitudes, was um, adamant. I mean, he, there were no ands, ifs, or buts. Once he, once he got to that point emotionally, let's say, he, he, stuck, in, he stuck with it. Uh, there was a lovely, uh, to me, <laughs> a dazzling occasion when uh, he showed me a letter he'd just got from Edmund Wilson, Apropos his having sent Edmund Wilson, I think, the manuscript of the Sorrows of Priapus, and he'd hoped that Wilson might help him find a publisher for it. And apparently Wilson had tried and taken the book around to several f people, friends and whatever, and nothing really had come of it. So now he was writing to Edward to explain the situation, and uh, the letter was an incredibly um, obsequious, uh, self-effacing, humbling uh I mean, an incredible uh, lengthy uh, two pages, it seems to me, of single-space typing, in which he begins by saying Edward is truly the greatest writer of his, of his inf of, uh, you know, of anyone he's ever met or considered meeting. Edward is unequivocally the greatest writer of his, Edmund Wilson's time. And this book is possibly the, one of the most brilliant instances of that fact. And that he's taken it around to these, you know, sad publishers, but they are too stupid, et cetera, et cetera, to see its value, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, really an incredibly uh, placating letter. And Edward's response is, look, look at him snivel. <laughs> the, you know, the little worm is trying to get out of his obligations or his, you know, his responsibilities. You know, critics are simply snivelers, et cetera, in that way. And I was, I was dazzled simply because Edmund Wilson, for, again, to persons of my generation, had this literary authority, whether we liked it or not. And to have a, uh, it was lovely. I mean, it was really like a breath of extraordinarily fresh air to hear Edward reduce this, this large authority to, 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 to a, to a sniveling excuser. Whether he was or not, of course, is something else again. But, but nonetheless, that was characteristic of Edward's attitudes toward friend or foe, I would, I, was, I would assume. <coughs> and with Graves, uh, I think I remember vividly the last time I saw the two in company, uh, Edward and I had been down in, d I want to say, downtown Palma, sort of walking around. We'd ended up um, sitting in a cafe that's, you could probably identify it simply enough. I could walk to it, but I can't truly remember the name. It was one of the large open-air cafe sort of restaurant hotels. Uh, as you walk up the main street from the, from the port, it would be off to the right as though you're going up to the Plaza Mayor. And it sits on the left-hand side there. It's a kind of a large uh, open-air place. And we were sitting out there having uh, tea or beer or whatever. And uh, Graves happened by and sat down with us. And frankly, in, f in absolutely, uh, re you know, real, real, real uh, fairness to, to Graves, he was trying to be uh, uh, placating. I mean, he was just trying to, you know, get over this awkwardness that Edward had created by stamping out of his place. And so he simply sat down with us and passed a few words. And Edward's, I mean, Edward did sit like a little kid, you know, this kind of sullen withdrawal look on his face. And I don't think he spoke to, to uh, Graves. And at one point, Graves was sort of therefore talking primarily to me. So uh, he uh, got up after a few minutes to leave. And he offered his hand, uh, not, you know, not as let's shake and be friends, but he just, in part, said, you know, just kind of a quick gesture, he offered his hand to, to, um, to Edward, and Edward refused it. I mean, just didn't respond. Whereupon Graves said, in a kind of really brusque, irritated manner, uh, keep him, and just walked off. And that, I mean, that sadly to me seems to me, seems the, uh, both the dilemma and the, and, and the, um, and the cost of Edward's ha behavior at times that he just uh, he he does outrage people and he does it very intentionally at times and it probably equally at times he doesn't truly realize how how separating and hostile his gestures truly are. 
I mean, thank God, frankly, I've never had them directed specifically toward myself, but I mean, I think the whole dilemma between Graves and, and uh, Dahlberg is simply that Dahlberg begins by, frankly, wanting Graves' help with finding an apartment. Graves is intrigued and, 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 and interested by this, by this man. Um, then Graves' literary conduct becomes unacceptable to Edwards. It's possibly also an ego conflict of, of a, you know, a more usual order. Uh, finds that reason for, for rejecting Graves, al although he has actually been dependent on Graves initially to give him some help. Uh, Graves, understandably, is, is, is hurt by this and, and uh, turns off. Uh, in other words, what, what Edward would finally, I think, qualify Graves as being would be a man with real gifts who uses them in a lightweight fashion and whose, whose emotions are, are, are never strong enough to sustain some real commitment so that he ends up a kind of a, a flashy, a superficial writer, although he has the intelligence and the information to be far more. I don't know that, th I know that's a harsh judgment. I don't know how accurate it is or isn't. I think, I mean, I think it's certainly one. The type, I realize now that Edward did, like he got a place in Solier where he lived for a time. I must have therefore seen him apropos Richard Arlington when he was leaving that place or coming back. I, did, I think I only went out there once to see him in Solier, as I remember it. Um, for some reason, it was awkward to get there. You used to have to come into the Palma. Or you could if you had a car. We had a car, but for some reason, we just didn't get together after he went, much after he went out to Solier. So the time I really saw him was when he was still in the city trying to locate. And we kept in cars. We wrote back and forth a little bit. He generously contributed to the Black Mountain Review. He got, for example, the, that's that letter from Herbert Reed and, and his own, which is the, in the last issue. Um, I really dug him. I mean, I was completely interested to publish anything of his he would send. Um, then I was living in New Mexico for some time. We correspond occasionally. And he always was good news. I mean, he he always put me in a wry place of self-judgment that had a kind of, you know, paradoxically humorous, humorous feel to it. And I really, I really sort of, uh, I dug him as this weird, eccentric, maverick, uh, self-designed writer. I really thought he was uh, extremely interesting. So, from time to time, I would, gen I would hear from him, and it really made me feel good. And then, when he was in Kansas City. I know you mentioned Jeffrey. It seems to me that he and Julia were then, he had that job at, San, at, at uh, Kansas City. And I happily was able to stop and spend, a, seems to me maybe I spent a night with him and walked in Swope Park with Edward, which was terrific. Uh, he, was ex he was talking of the situation of the black community in such loud and clear terms. I thought we were going to be X'd out then and there. <laughs> saying you see them now they walk with complete you know social uh, as, uh, I can't remember quite his phrase but it was a beautiful one apropos their their social uh, containment so why well, I remember when you would never see a black person in this park you know now, now they're letting them run everywhere you know it was like a, a wild anglo-saxon take um, which I thought frankly would get us into trouble if, if anybody overheard it and but again the 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 kind of he has a kind of wild humor back of it all. It's, I oftentimes think in conversation, especially that he's he's not testing the credulity of his of his um, of his company, but that he's really seeing how far they'll permit themselves to be put on before they'll actually say what they really do want to say. Uh, and he's got a kind of wild, canny wit that I really enjoy. Um, so anyhow, I saw him therefore in Kansas City, and then again we didn't see him for. for or really much hear from him for a long time uh, until uh, it was one summer when we were living in the house in New Mexico and I remember it was myself Bobby and our oldest daughter who was then away it was going to school in Massachusetts part of the year and she was home for the summer and a friend of hers from that school was visiting and our two younger daughters and suddenly there is a call saying that Edward, Julia and Arlene are proceeding east and are just on the outskirts of Albuquerque and thought, if agreeable, that they would like to come and see us and possibly, if also simple, would, would enjoy, you know, it would be frankly helpful to them to spend the night. 
So again, I gave Edward directions, which he again qualified by saying, I hope, Robert, that you, Bob, that you actually have these correct now, because I'm really depending on you. You know, it, was, it really made me feel extraordinarily uneasy about, now, have I given him the accurate directions? I mean, I obviously know I live here, and I obviously know how to get here, but have I in some awful moment mistaken a particular street for a particular other street? I mean, I really always felt very gingerly about giving Edward any information of, of any kind that he was going to depend upon, because, you know, I felt, God help me if I've got it wrong. But anyhow, he happily arrived. Uh, in the time just before his arrival, there was this incredible house cleaning and, and, and uh, getting the house into uh, you know comfortable order, although it frankly wasn't that disarrayed to begin with. But I told Bobby a lot you know, of my senses of Edward and how, how, you know, the kinds of cranky demand he would have at times and things like that. And so when she realized this man was literally to be in the house, <laughs> and she dug his writing also, uh, she really um, set to and... She didn't know what to expect. Happily, Edward's take on her was that she was a charming Irish woman and that I had done well indeed to have found her. And the dinner went off. And then also, Edward's eating habits were, were, were problematic because he he could reject some food off at him with absolute, you know, how dare you offer me this garbage. So uh, I was a little nervous about that, too. Uh, anyhow, I remember she, she, did, she, she uh, fried or baked chicken, like Texas style, and he really dug it. And uh, there was a lovely moment when <laughs> when uh, she uh, asked Arlene, um, do you think that, what would Edward like? I mean, what would he be able to eat or not eat? And um, Arlene said, oh, no, ask Julia about that. I just have to do with his with his intellectual literary <laughs> activities, which I thought was really beautiful. So happily, the, the th we had an extremely pleasant visit. All slept well and, and, and had, you know, a happy leave-taking in the morning. And I remember at that, that time he, he had read The Gold Diggers, which I hadn't realized. I think I probably sent him a copy, but I don't, didn't, didn't have any word back from him. Uh, or yes, he did, actually. He wrote uh, that he really had liked um, the writing in that book. Particularly, he liked the first story, The Unsuccessful Husband, which I suppose really conformed to senses of his, apropos or what, what I want to call loosely a literary tradition, that is, the information one gets from previous writers that have been decisive. I mean, the literary quality of that story is probably more marked than in the others, and which in a way makes it of less interest to me, but I could dig that Edward would recognize it as a far more deliberated piece of work than the subsequent writing, which is moving on far more intensive personal bases of statement. Yeah, so that was really, sadly, the last time I've seen him. I was in London, um, I want to say like around 68 or 69, one summer with Bobby and the our two daughters, Sarah and Kate, and Edward was. We have a. We have a. We had at that point the same publisher, the uh, Calder and Boyers, and Marion Boyers had been seeing a lot of Edward, and uh, he was on BBC and in interviews and celebrations and stuff. And she found him really interesting. I mean, she's a she's a very explicit, clear woman herself, and she was sort of intrigued by him. R. B. Kitai had had uh, also, uh, I think, had him as a kind of neighbor and was intrigued to realize that there was apparently no living writer <laughs> that Edward would accept as being of any interest whatsoever. Um, so he was really both exasperated and intrigued by this by this odd man. Unhappily, that visit, I didn't see him. There was possibility to see him, which I, I, I didn't. I, I continue to feel badly about it. But we were there for two weeks. <laughs> it sounds like a weird... It sounds like I sound like Edmund Wilson. We were there for two weeks, and I just couldn't get into the emotional demands that I was quite sure would be Edward's occasion if, 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 if we got together. So I don't know that I have a, a great deal any otherwise to add. Um, now you've hopefully spoken to Graves this summer if, you, if he was there. Um, Olson, Olson the, the, the anecdote that Terry Burns speaks of, I I was never clear as to whether it was Gloucester that Olson... My, my take on that story was that Edward was staying in Gloucester for the summer and that Charles um, was very anxious to meet him and therefore sort of hung around and or stood in the hallway for a period of some hours so that when Edward came out of his room, Charles could seemingly be there in a casual manner and, and, and could... Uh, Introduce himself without apparently, you know, apparently being some autograph hound or something. Uh, 
I know that they were. I know. I know that Edward said he introduced Charles to his first wife, Connie. That is uh, Charles's first wife, Connie, and that they had been double dating sisters, Connie and her sister. And uh, it was later a point that Edward would bring out. So I introduced this man to his wife, and look how he turns on me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Charles was really turned off, Edward in subsequent years. It wasn't that he was like putting him down or something, but he felt that he was such a problematic human being he just couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't um, keep a relation with him. <coughs> he felt he was really possessed, as you would say, by the demonic. That he uh, friends like uh, friends thus of them both like Ephraim Donner would obviously feel that same. They've, Ed was left a sad wake of uh, of really hostile people in terms of his I mean, you get a little of it in the hysterical report of Nell Rice about his conduct in Black Mountain, which I frankly know nothing about. But I'm sure it's an it's a it's a, it's an overstatement to put it mildly. Um, he, I don't know. He's like he really the, the sexuals had really a a power in, in his use of it that was pretty disturbing. E.g., the woman again from in Mallorca who suddenly found herself in this obviously intimate relation with him without c clearly knowing at what point, literally in the conversation, all this had been, you know, all this had had been, had happened. She really felt possessed by him. I mean, you know, not merely sexually, but she really felt like he'd taken over her whole reality and somehow so dominated it, although she was a strong, clear English woman, that she, uh, she had, I mean, she was just there as some, as some odd material. I'm going to quit here and uh, return this tape to you, Charles, and if, if there are subsequent questions, specific questions like they say, why don't you simply return it to me and I'll use the other side to get them on. But for the moment, this really seems the first take, and at least I got something done, so here you are. Okie doke.